when we're talking about um, craft, it's the reason that the public service really exists. The role that we play in democracy, and I think for individuals it gives purpose. And so really understanding that, it gives you purpose um, and an understanding of um, the APS, how to navigate it, your responsibilities that you have for your own personal development, really how to collaborate, engage and work with your colleagues across the service to achieve a particular outcome. So our craft is our skills and capabilities in the, in the Australian Public Service to ensure that we can deliver effective services on behalf of Australian government to Australian citizens. So it's all the things that we need to know about how we do our business, what are the processes, procedures, what's the legislation, what are the skills that you need to do your job as an effective public servant. It all comes back to evidence-based decision making and as a public service we have an obligation to provide our decision makers with robust evidence um, that we've you know spent a lot of time researching so that they can justify their decisions to the Australian public. It doesn't matter what agency you work for because we all really operate as one big family and we all have a common goal which is to make the most efficient and successful decisions. We have public servants across Australia, overseas, and they also need training and development in public service craft capabilities. So I'm actually really excited that we've started using the word craft. There are a handful of things which, which we learn uh, uh, and we practise in the public service that are special. We want to be trusted and reliable. We want to be able to create value to the Australian citizen. That's our job in the public sector, to deliver government policies and services that create value to Australian citizens. So the more skillful we can do that, the more efficiently we can do that, the more effectively we can do that, the more value we create to the Australian citizen. We want to be a learning organisation. We want to be an organisation that cares about knowledge and custodianship of knowledge. I like to describe the Academy as kind of an all-round learning experience. I think by having all of that information in one place, it makes it quite accessible for anyone in the APS, wherever they are, at any time that they wish to learn something. And maybe through that sharing of knowledge, we could come up with more efficient solutions to a lot of problems, because a problem I might be facing in my agency might have already been addressed and solved by someone else in a different agency, but we just haven't heard of it because we didn't have the portal to connect us. This is a natural evolution of the kind of strategy and policy that the Commission has been pursuing for some years but it is very exciting to see it pulled together and branded in a way which I think will allow it to have enormous impact. One of the great things about um, kind of having maybe a hub is being able to know that there's a tr kind of a trusted source of information where you can access a whole range of resources. I haven't stumbled across that in the APS yet, so that would be very helpful. It's a one-stop shop if you want to call it that simply being able to learn at my own pace, sort of online, being able to pause, go outside for a walk whenever I need to and get my brain reinvigorated um, is something that really helps me learn. If I want to move out of my area into a line area out of corporate, then it's almost I need these skills. We attract wonderful people to the public service because they are really interested in making a difference and um, helping their country making sure that the service is capable of delivering um, at its best to the Australian community. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining us today in Old Parliament House for the official launch of our APS Academy. Apologies if you didn't know, you were in the video and it was going to be shown at the outset. <laughs> I'm, I'm Pat Hetherington, Acting Deputy Public Service Commissioner and I'll be your MC today. Um, I'm really pleased that we're able to gather in such numbers here today. It was looking a bit doubtful there for a while, uh, but please try to be COVID safe uh, as we're all here together today. Um, the event is also being recorded and I would like to welcome those watching on video. 
Today you hear from a range of speakers, the Australian Public Service Commissioner, Mr Peter Walcott, Distinguished Professor Genevieve Bell and Assistant Minister, the Honourable Ben Morton, who will officially open the APS Academy for us. But to get started, as we should on all such occasions, uh, I'd like to invite Ngunnawal Elder, Auntie Violet, to the stage to commence proceedings with a welcome to country. Auntie Violet. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to perform a welcome to country. Not the first time I was lucky I was in the city, so I was called up at the last second. <laughs> How are you, Kat? So, to me, a welcome to country is a traditional Aboriginal blessing, symbolised in the traditional owner's consent to an event to take place on their land. And it also shows respect for the first peoples of the land you are meeting on. The reason for this custom is to protect your spirit while you are here. Uh, my people, the Ngunnawal people, have a great culture and heritage, heritage that we'd like to share with all Australians. As you may be aware, Canberra means meeting place, and it has been a place of gathering for my people and where they come together to deal with important business. Ngunnawal people have conducted ceremonies on these lands over many years. My people have had, have danced on what is known as the Actual Peninsula, home of the National Museum, to a place known as Black Mountain Tower. These areas are rich with traditions from our ancient rock art in the Inamaji National Park. It is important for all, for all of us to acknowledge and to recognise our unique histories and to gain an understanding that our land is our heritage and how the loss of land has disconnected many of Indigenous peoples from their spiritual links, culture, and heritage and identity. And that's why I believe a lot of our young people have lost their way and a lot of our people are incarcerated today. We need to connect with our, uh, with our culture once again and we as elders need to, to uh, lead the way. I'd like to pay my respects to my elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect if there's any other Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people in your room or watching around uh, online at the moment. I'd like to also acknowledge um, Assistant Commissioner Ben Morton, Commissioner Peter Walcox, Distinguished Professor Ger Genevieve Bell, uh, Grant Lovelock, Secretary Phil Gats, Gates, you know, I hope I got that right. I hate getting names wrong. I'll tell you a little story later on about Kofi Annan, what I got his name wrong. <laughs> Ed over the AP, Ed over Australian Public Service. In keeping the general spirit of friendship and reconciliation, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon on behalf of my people, the Ngunnawal people who are the tradition owners of the land you are meeting on this afternoon. And we just remember, COVID's still around. We have to be safe. God bless you all. And don't forget to get vaccinated. Thank you so much. Aunty <laughs> Violet, thank you. thank you so much for that wonderfully warm welcome to country. <clears throat> we won't tell him. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we're on today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So um, I'm going to pass over to Public Service Commissioner um, in just a moment to talk about the capabilities and plans for the Academy going forward, and we'll ask uh, the Commissioner to also introduce Distinguished Professor Genevieve Bell. Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be here. And can I also echo Auntie Violet in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and paying my respect to elders past, present and emerging. So, and I'd also like to add my welcome to you all. Good to see so many members of the faculty uh, here and so many members of the Learning Board, which I'll talk about in a moment. We've moved quickly in the last six months in setting up the Academy. In reality, however, the reform journey that has led us to this point started well over a decade ago. Back in 2010, the Moran Report, which you'll all remember, ahead of the game, highlighted the need to invest in the capability of the public service. 
From this, the Centre for Leadership and Learning was established to assist with shaping and enhancing the capability of the APS workforce. It did a good job. A recent review of the Centre emphasised the quality of its offerings, particularly around leadership. Building on the strong foundations laid by the Moran Report, the 30 Review of 2019 examined APS capability from a number of angles. Its final report commented on the widespread availability of quality training and professional development for APS employees, including through the Centre for Leadership and Learning. However, 30's report also observed that there was a lack of guidance on what is essential or core to being a great public servant. In addition, he called out the need for a more concentrated approach to learning and development. 30 went on to recommend development of an APS-wide workforce strategy, a learning and development strategy, and an APS professions model. These recommendations were subsequently endorsed by the government. The workforce strategy was launched three months ago and is now in implementation phase. The APS professions were launched in October 2019 with the establishment of an HR professional stream followed by digital and data professions uh, last year. And good to see the heads of professions here also today. And I'm pleased to announce the release earlier this week of the first ever APS Learning and Development Strategy and Action Plan. The L&D strategy outlines four clear areas of focus, governance, capability, technology, and culture. The action plan sets out the practical steps to implement the strategy over a five-year horizon. A priority in achieving the vision of the L&D strategy is the establishment of the first ever APS Learning Board and our emphasis very much on partnerships and one APS. The Learning Board will create partnerships and efficiencies in L&D across the APS by driving greater cooperation, coordination and collaboration. In doing so, it will directly address the fragmented approach to APS learning and development that was highlighted by the 30 Review. The membership of the Learning Board, which I announced earlier today, will consist of six senior APS Chief Operating Officers and four externals. It will also work closely with the existing professional streams to ensure that we continue to develop capability across the service in these critical areas. In tangible terms, the Academy will enable all APS employees to access consistent, high quality learning and development options, whatever their role and wherever they are located. And they'll be able to customise their learning journey with a broad range of learning approaches on offer, experiential learning, on the job training, mobility and secondments, as well as intensive face-to-face -face courses. Now, more than ever, Australia needs a public service that is highly capable, outward-facing, well-connected and more mobile. The Academy will embody these themes through its focus on practitioner-led development, its partnership model, its close connection with the professional streams and its reach across the breadth of the APS workforce. In concluding, I want to thank Phil Gaitchens and the Secretary's Board for the way they've helped drive this new approach. For the establishment of the Academy represents a fundamental shift in how we will build APS capability now and well into the future. It is therefore fitting that we have a renowned futurist, technologist and anthropologist in distinguished Professor Genevieve Bell here with us today who will deliver our keynote address. Distinguished Professor Bell is currently the Director of the School of Cybernetics and 3A Institute at the Australian National University as well as being a Vice President and Senior Fellow at Intel. So over to you, Genevieve. I'm not sure what it says about me, but every time I hear myself referred to as a distinguished professor, I have a slight twitch. I think that may say more about me than the title. However, I realise standing here, I feel a little bit like an imposter, a thing I often feel standing in rooms like this, giving talks like this. I feel I probably need to put one card on the table, which was that in 1985 I joined the Australian Public Service, uh, the Department of Local Government and Administrative Services. My secretary was Kenneth Norman Jones. I had to look that up because I will admit at the time I don't think I knew his name. Uh, because I joined the Australian Public Service as a very, very junior clerk in an office whose principal purpose was to determine uh, how to give government funding to contracts for government services to Australian companies in a tender bid between $1 million and $20 million. That was the brief. The activity involved a photocopier with five different sorts of coloured paper and a Wang Wode processor, and I was the only person who knew how to use it. Uh, unsurprisingly, I was very popular. Uh, however, at the time, I don't think I imagined 
what the public service did. I certainly didn't imagine what it took to be a good public servant. And I don't think I imagined what it took to be a good employee in any other place. There's something about being 17 in your first job where you don't always know what might come next. I was incredibly lucky that the people I work with here in the Australian Public Service were kind and decided I shouldn't be a public servant. <laughs> and diligently let me go to America to gain an education, a set of work experiences, and were equally gracious about me coming home many, many, many years later to join the Australian National University, which is where I now ply my trade. So it's an incredible privilege to get to be here. It's an honour to get to be in a room with people I know who have dedicated the arc of their careers to doing extraordinary work, extraordinary work in the public service and in the service of the public. It's also an honour to be somewhere where we get to celebrate learning and the notion that just because we're good at our jobs doesn't mean there isn't ways we can be better at our jobs and aren't ways in which we can bring other people along on that journey with us. I also want to acknowledge where we're standing, which for me is a couple of different things. I too want to echo Arnie Violet in acknowledging the land we're on and in her injunction that we should all get vaccinated. That seems like an important message as part of all of that. But I want to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this place, to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, to recognise that we're on land that was always sacred and was never ceded, and land that is important both in its history and in its present and in its through line to our futures. And also to acknowledge that I get to say those words in a place that increasingly knows what that means. It's not just a ritual, it is in fact a set of responsibilities that we get to carry forward and that should infuse all the work we do. I'm also acutely aware that the very first time I ever saw this building was from the lawn in January 1972 at the Tent Embassy. And so thinking about what it means to also be in a place in which an entire other conversation has unfolded feels particularly useful to mark. So I also want to pay my respects to owners and traditional elders in other places. I'm aware that these remarks are being recorded and will find their way into many, many other places. I also want to say that one of the lovely things about coming back to Australia is that I get to do that every time I open my mouth, whereas in America that is an increasingly only new and recent thing. And there is something about being able to acknowledge where we are and where we start that feels really important and really powerful. So I often get called a futurist. It's another label with which I feel I might have a bit of profound discomfort. Uh, I'm not really sure that it's good to be a futurist. Most science fiction writers will tell you that as a futurist it is the surest way to make a fool of yourself, is to predict the future. And I'm pretty certain William Gibson, who is one of my favourite authors, knew that when he was asked by a journalist in 2003 to tell that journalist the future. And I'm fairly certain that what the journalist hoped William would say was bright, shiny, 7G, blinky lights, very, really great. And William didn't say that because how could you know what the future would really look like in 2003? What he said and said was that the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. That might, at first pass, sound like a deflection, like a way of getting out of answering a question. Some of you will recognise it uh, as a deflection. I think it's also a provocation and an invitation. A provocation because what it suggests is actually the future's not some distant destination we might go to occupy. It might already be here. The provocation is that it's unevenly distributed, that it might not be the future you're expecting. And I think the piece of it that's the invitation is it's an invitation to look around us and to look at the present with a slightly different view. If we were to look at the present and say, where is the future happening right now? Would we be able to see it, make sense of it, take advantage of it, and be willing to do something with that knowledge? Bearing in mind that the future doesn't usually turn up with a sign that says, hi, I'm the future. Please manage me accordingly. It frequently turns up in unexpected and uh, sometimes troubling ways. I'm willing to bet most of you recognise this image. Uh, I'd make it the interactive part of the program. Does anyone recognise this image? I've asserted that you do. Yes, what is this? This is the Ever Given stuck in the Suez Canal. That is correct. It is a ship in a place it probably shouldn't be, or at least at an angle it shouldn't be. Uh, many of us, I assure, watched this because it was the middle of COVID and it was nice to have a spectacle that wasn't our own. And we watched this boat and we pondered and wondered how it got there and how it was going to get out again. And some of us wondered about what the consequences of it would be if it were stuck there much longer. Because it turns out if this was a piece of the future in the present, it wasn't about boats getting too big for waterways, it was about the incredible fragility of a supply chain that operated on a just-in-time fulfilment logic and mechanism. And for companies and organisations all over the world, they had 
organize themselves in such a way where goods and services could move seamlessly across the entire planet in relatively short periods of time. That's great. It means you don't have to have a warehouse, you don't have to keep things where you can't sell them, you can move things around. That only works when you can move things around. And if Gibson were to be asked, I imagine, about the Ever Given and what it said about the future that was here but unevenly distributed, he might say, actually, the future is about systems and about what happens when we are overly reliant on those systems but we don't always see them. Here the system we saw was waterways, not supply chains, because it's quite hard to see a supply chain. A whole lot of the systems that we encounter have only been visible to us in the breaking of them, whether it is the consequences of the bushfires in Australia that made it quite hard for telecommunications to function, where electrical systems went down, where roads didn't work, where, in fact, one of the only systems that kept functioning was our social institutions and our civic democracy, whether it's been the pandemic where we can lay out all of the ways that the systems haven't all functioned the way we hoped, or where there were systems we didn't know about, how viruses moved, how removalists move, how vaccines do and don't move. There are many systems, how toilet paper moves and doesn't move. Um, there are many systems we have seen, but the thing about systems is they're really only visible when they're not working, right? When they're working effectively, you don't see them. That actually means that systems are one of the critical, both challenges and also theoretical instruments of the 21st century. I think about the arc of my career and of many of yours, we've come up thinking about how do we talk about people and communities and countries and states and governments, and we have thought about those as units of analysis and units of intervention. My suspicion is we are standing at the beginning of the unevenly distributed already here future, where in fact the critical object of scrutiny is the system. And finding ways to talk about, see, make visible, regulate, stop, decommission or even secure those systems is really pretty tricky because they tend to span organizations, they sometimes span places, they span sectors, they certainly span government departments and whilst the public service has changed a great deal since June 1985, I know it hasn't changed so much that there aren't still lines between departments and information that doesn't flow, well, quite as well as you might hope. So how would you think about systems then? Well, this would be the bit where, obviously, I have a new job, and like when you have new jobs, you feel the need to talk about it a lot. Uh, I actually think the notion of a cybernetic system is a really helpful way to make those systems visible and to think about how we would both talk about a system theoretically and how we would work through it pragmatically. Theoretically, the notion of a cybernetic system is an idea that came into vogue in the 1940s and 1950s. It is the idea of a system where there is a control point and a way to steer that system. It is hugely important because it was also a way of theorizing systems where the system had to always include people, technology, and the environment. You couldn't have a system that was one of those things. You had to have a system that was all three of those things. And you actually had to be able to go find the pieces of the system that were those things. The early protagonists in the cybernetic conversation would say that one of the problems was we tended to think it was a technical system and there were no people involved. Uh, I'm willing to bet the last time you had a repair person at your house to fix something or something that didn't function in your building, you realise that technology only works as well as the people who install it, repair it and keep it running. It is equally the case that most of these systems in, 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 exist in contexts, whether those are built contexts or natural contexts, whether it is the fact that most of the contemporary technology we build requires an enormous amount of energy, <laughs> intellectual, human, but also the kind that comes out of the wall when you plug things in. Uh, we don't talk about it terribly much, but next generation AI systems use an inordinate amount of electricity. Uh, just storing the current data that circulates the planet now is somewhere between 5 to 10% of the entire world's energy budget. So thinking about how these systems unfold uh, requires thinking across multiple dimensions. So Cybernetic gives us a theoretical tool for that. It says you need to also pay attention to feedback loops. So how does information flow? How do you manage the dynamics of all of those things? It's also an interesting pragmatic playbook that I think speaks well to the APS's academy and the notion of building capacity. Because in order to get to that theory, it took years of conversations. It took bringing people from radically different places and putting them in the same room together. It took bringing together mathematicians and chemists and physicists and economists and psychologists and biologists and anthropologists and fine artists and poets. And putting them all in a room together and working out how to hold them in conversation. 
because most of us know getting a lot of different room, voices in the room is easy. Getting them to have a conversation is incredibly difficult. Getting them to have a meaningful conversation where they listen to each other and do something different as a result of that is harder still. These guys knew that it took time. They knew that it took building trust. They knew that it took finding a shared vocabulary. And they knew that it took educating each other about their craft and their praxis. And so for me, when I think about what makes cybernetics a powerful tool for now, is that it is both theory and craft. And this piece for me that sits right through it, this notion of the biological, the technical, and the human, the interplay of those systems, feels particularly relevant right now in 2021, when many of the challenges facing our citizens and our companies and our government are about the interplay of all these things. They're not just about one piece. It's not just about how do we build a de technical infrastructure. It's also about how do we create a group of people who are skilled in regulating it, who know how to ask the right questions about it, who know how to think about what its uh, challenges and limitations are, and who know how to think about what it means to do that in a sustainable way, not just economically sustainable, but environmentally sustainable. So when I started to think about what it would mean to build a new school, uh, I happened to be directing the first new school in the Australian National University this century, and in, in fact 30 years. We don't have a lot of muscle memory about how to build a new school anymore. Uh, and for me, the notion of how did you build something and why would you do it turn out to be really important questions. I think much like the ones that run through the public service about why you would need to reimagine the APS Academy. And for me, it was about how do you create a generation of thinkers and doers, critical thinkers and critical doers, who know how to ask questions, who know how to find a set of answers, there's never just one, and who know how to have conversations across disciplines, across time, across preoccupations, and across intentionality. And so for me, it was about how did you bring those conversations from the 1940s and the 1950s, which, by the way, were also conversations with a politic. Not a politics, but a politic. In 1946, when the conversations about cybernetics happened, they happened against the backdrop of World War II. That collection of people gathered in a room, not just because they were good human beings and liked to talk to each other, far from it. They partly gathered in that room because they saw what the world had been and they wanted it to never be that way again. And they looked at the technology that was on the horizon and the technology that was possible, and they wanted with each other to create a different kind of future than the one that was unevenly distributed around them. They wanted to make something deliberately different. And so for me, when I think about what it means to build something new, when I think about what it means to build a cybernetic system workforce, I guess, in the 21st century, it's about how you are always a work in progress, but how that work in progress has a politic. Again, not a politics, but a politic. It has a point of view, much like the APS Academy, which clearly has a point of view. It has a point of view about skills. It has a point of view about craft. It has a point of view about being reflective and about being oriented to learning. For me, the school I'm building has a point of view too. It's a point of view that says, if we are going to live in systems, we should design them. We should actually think consciously and deliberately about who's in the room when we have the conversation. We should also think about who isn't in the room and why. And we should work out how to create jobs that don't exist yet. And I suspect that will be one of the outcomes of your academy too, is that new jobs will come into existence because there are new challenges. And the constellation of those new skills will create new possibilities and new people. All of which is to say, if you imagine that the future's already here and it's unevenly distributed, I think my question to you, and particularly to those of you who are staffing up a new academy, is what is the future around you that you want to accelerate? And what is the future around you you want to ensure doesn't happen anymore? Because that's the opportunity that we have with learning. We have the opportunity to create a different future, one that we want to inhabit, one for me that is clearly grounded in a sense of the system, because I don't think we can get away from it. And oh, by the way, those systems are getting increasingly more complicated. They get more complicated because they involve next generation computation. As soon as you add AI to anything, it gets more complicated. As soon as you flow data through it, it gets more complicated. As soon as you connect it to other systems in other places, it gets more complicated. So what it is going to take to be a successful maker of policy, a successful interrogator of the world, means being able to see a system, know when to intervene in it, and know where it is around you. And I think that particular talent is both exquisitely necessary and extraordinarily hard. And I hope more than anything that it's one of the things you work out how to do inside this academy, because I look at my country 
and I look at the challenges we have, and I know what we need more than almost anything else is a group of people who can see systems and want to build ones that are slightly different than the ones we have now. So, one last thing I want to say before I stop and say thank you. Uh, one of the interesting things I learned in my time in Silicon Valley, so 20 years living and breathing in the middle of America's technological heartland, is that there is a persistent story that amazing things happen in Silicon Valley because a lone inventor had a good idea. With very few exceptions, that turns out not to be true. It's, it's an excellent story, it's a lovely myth, and is never borne out in reality. And what it tends to mask is that most good ideas have an entire collection of people that it takes to make them possible. And I guess my invitation and my request here is that I know you're doing something new and I know I'm doing something new too. What it takes to do new things means being willing to ask other people for help. It means not being willing to think you're gonna do it all by yourself. It means being absolutely willing to be vulnerable enough to say, I don't know what the answer is here, or I don't know how to do this thing. And it means being willing to constantly make an invitation to others for help. I'm going to accept the invitations that the APS is making me in order to turn up in places like this to be helpful, but there's a little bit of a quid pro quo. <laughs> we are in the process of recruiting for our fourth cohort of master's students, so the next generation of critical thinkers and critical doers. If you know someone who you think should be in our cohort, will you send them my way? And if as the arc of your jobs unfold, you think to yourself, hmm, that cybernetic thing sounds vaguely interesting, you all know where to find me. <laughs> so with that, I want to say congratulations, uh, good luck, and I know the future is here already, and it's just a matter of working out which bit of it that you want. So with that, I'm going to stop and say thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks, Professor Bell. I um, had planned some pithy summary of that, but I feel pretty confident I wouldn't do it justice. Um, I, I would just make one point. I think the, the, the points you make around system thinking will resonate for everybody in this room. Certainly the challenges we've faced uh, over the last little while and the challenges we will face into the future will require us to uh, think in the way that you've described. The Academy is an effort to bring us closer together as one APS and help to drive that forward. Um, it's now my very great pleasure to welcome Assistant Minister Morton to give some remarks and officially launch our academy. Minister Morton, please. Uh, look, thank you, thank you, Pat, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Peter, for, for hosting us today, and also Phil, for your head of, uh, head of the APS, and uh, an APS in, in which I'm sure you're very proud of, and I know the government is very proud of, uh, as well. Artie Violet, thank you so much for your uh, welcome to country. Uh, Professor Bell, I was a little bit distracted thinking about if, if you're at Feral Data, what does that make David Gruen, um, <laughs> which I'm sure is anything other than Feral Data. Um, but it was quite interesting to hear from you today, um, you know, working at the, you've really, you know, I've got a whole script here of things I was going to say, a bit like Pat was going to, but, you know, thinking about systems, thinking about how society is changing, or in some cases how it hasn't changed, uh, thinking about how we uh, apply these learnings and lessons here in the, in the public service. Uh, when I took responsibility for the government's deregulation agenda, um, regulations are very much about systems. They're very much about processes. They're very much about um, uh, forms and, and procedure. Uh, what we discovered, though, is that if we're going to tackle the issues in relation to the government's deregulation agenda, uh, rather than precisely looking at those forms or processes or those procedures, we actually have to look at culture. And so in order to uh, get probably a harder, longer-term piece of work, but we'll have greater gains over time, will be in relation to how do we think about these particular issues. And I wasn't going to speak about something that happened this week uh, today. Uh, I was going to speak about it at a deregulation co uh, conference that was going to happen. But... Uh, uh, there was an example, and Angela from my office is cringing now because she knows I'm going to tell the story about cocktails and the Australian Taxation Office, who have done fantastic work this week, and we're, we're going to be able to say more about that um, publicly uh, soon. In fact, it's probably happening now that I've, I've said it. But um, uh, we had a situ situation that in COVID, um, the system said that if you are a restaurant and you make cocktails and you serve those cocktails during COVID, uh, sorry, before COVID, at your restaurant. That's fine. Uh, but if you want to use Deliveroo, if you want to uh, 
uh, send those cocktails in a, in a bottle, probably more likely a jar, uh, to your customers who have ordered takeaway food, um, uh, well then you need to enter the excise regime because that's what the system says. And therefore, in entering the excise regime, that's okay um, because you just need to fill in the 16-page form to enter the regime, the system. You need to... Um, it's okay because uh, all the alcohol that you've bought to make your cocktails uh, have had the excise paid on it already and it's okay because then you fill another form in in order to report what you've paid on the excise on the bottles you've bought and then what you've charged your customers and you won't have to pay anything to the ATO. So it's all okay, you've just got to fill in the 16 page form and you've got to keep doing it every month in order to, um, in order to uh, uh, remit your excise. And, and through the regulator cohort, which was developed because of the need to talk about culture, um, we've raised this with Chris Jordan, the Taxation Commissioner, and it didn't create, it didn't need any legislation change. <coughs> it didn't need uh, any regulation change. Uh, it needed uh, very hard-working, diligent um, public servants at the ATO to be able to know that within that system that they have a culture and where they can say, well, this actually seems a bit silly. Um, and so this week, um, uh, they've thought that it's a little bit silly. Um, they thought that uh, this isn't a process that needs to occur. And through culture and through questioning the system, um, we'll be able to announce that, uh, so just because of timing, that if you are in lockdown in Sydney or, or Melbourne, um, that if you are getting a cocktail that you'd enjoy in person at your favourite restaurant and they want to send it to you in a jar, that that restaurant isn't going to have to worry about that 16-page form. That restaurant isn't going to have to worry about remitting that excise. And that required no legislation, no change. That required an ability where we invest in our people, we trust our people. We've got great public servants in the APS and we have to empower them to think about what are the things uh, that are, uh, you know, where the system works and where the system ought to be challenged. And I wasn't going to say that today, but um, uh, you know, you've, uh, uh, Professor Bell, you've prompted a whole range of thinking um, and I, I could tell another story, and I'll be here for ages and ages and ages, but um, uh, I'll, be, I'll be taking the thinking that you've, you've set it into my mind uh, today uh, into a number of conversations that, uh, that I'll be having over the coming weeks, uh, because it is appropriate um, that we do trust in uh, the professionals that do work um, for us. And the APS has shown themselves to be amazingly critical to the Australian people over the last 18 months. Um, our chart out of COVID has been developed, has been advised, has been supported by the great members of the Australian uh, Public Service. And the Australian community have seen that. Um, I think they expect a lot from the Public Service. I think as a result of the Public Service's success, they'll continue to expect a lot more. Um, I think that their, the future will ever be changing, but the expectations on the Public Service um, uh, will, will remain. We know that in the future we'll have economic and health and security challenges ahead of us, um, no matter what the future will bring. And we know that the public service will play a key role in supporting the Australian people. Uh, we know that the public service will need to continue to give the government, of whichever flavour, the highest quality advice. Uh, we know uh, that the public service needs to have that sense of purpose, needs to have that direct connection to the people in which it serves, and for the Australian people to better understand the role in which public servants, whether they be in Antarctica or in Darwin, um, or um, uh, I, I, I feel Francis even communicating with me now, whether they be on the other side of the globe, um, as I shouldn't forget the public servants that serve the Australian people in the, uh, in the Foreign Service. And so bringing, bringing uh, the Academy together to focus on the APS craft, um, the Academy is going to um, uh, bring together in, in one place, uh, both physically and, and online, an ability for us to improve um, our communication of those particular elements of APS craft. And one of those particular elements is engagement and partnership. And we saw, that's why we responded so well to COVID-19. Uh, we saw different elements of the public service engage with stakeholders. That was the feedback that the government received directly from industry. Uh, and that was occurring from regulators, from government departments. We know that Treasury um, created a business uh, engagement unit. Every morning at the height of COVID, the Prime Minister was briefed in relation to feedback that that particular unit within the public service was getting direct messages from the business engagement service at Treasury in relation to those issues. 
uh, I see Andrew Colvin here, when, they, when, when we faced disaster, we created a task force that got out and spoke to regional people in their communities, on their doorsteps and in their community halls, engaging with them directly about the issues uh, that they were, they were facing. And next week, I'll be really pleased to go down to Services Australia, where the surge capacity or the surge force that we've put in place uh, has already been activated again for helping Services Australia deal with the large number of phone calls um, and, and, uh, and issues coming into Services Australia to support Australians in need. And I know that that contribution is being assisted by so very many um, departments and agencies within the public service, and I thank all of those individuals, supervisors and, and uh, managers and secretaries for assisting uh, the, uh, those employees to uh, go into that surge force and to, to support the, uh, the Australian people in that way. In February, I announced the creation of the APS um, Academy. Uh, it's very important for me that it's here in Old Parliament House. Um, you know, for 60 years, Old Parliament House, and, and Daryl, thank you for hosting us here, um, it's been the heart of our democracy. And for me, uh, as an elected member of Parliament, as an administrator, I contribute to our Australian democracy in a particular way. But every public service, servant, every public servant contrib contributes to our democracy. And so no better place to have the APS Academy than in this building that is just the, the, the focal point of uh, communicating the importance of and the successes of the uh, Australian democracy. So it's my, uh, my pleasure to uh, today uh, formally launch the new APS uh, Academy. I want to thank all of those people that have been involved uh, in the collaborative effort, drawing on contributions right across the, the APS. Um, the, the success of this academy will be um, not because of, well, I, I love where it's located here at Old Parliament House. It, the success of this academy will be because of the, uh, the contribution of so many, um, not those that teach, um, uh, not just those that teach, um, not just those that lead the academy, um, and good luck, Grant, with, with your work, um, but those that come and share ideas. Um, you're, you know, if you're a, a graduate uh, that comes into this academy to, um, to learn something, um, you're also, I think, here to teach as well. I think share your experiences. Um, you know, if something doesn't seem right, if that system um, needs to be questioned, question it. If there are processes that don't seem right, share. I'm, actually, I'm going to share the story, and finally, <laughs> with what happened yesterday. Just one quick story, because it was, it was, a, it was I'm, going to, I'm going to do it. And, uh, Angela, Ange, I'm, I, I love the, uh, I'm so pleased with the APS that uh, um, I've had An Angela Clark join my uh, personal staff, who is from Treasury, which is me saying something, and, uh, but then worked to um, worked to PM and C, and she's shaking her head, saying, "Don't do it," but I'm, I'm going to. But um, yesterday, I was at a particular agency uh, looking at our government's deregulation agenda, and I was just so impressed with the work that they've put in um, uh, to um, uh, uh, to a particular. I was at two agencies, um, uh, and and I was impressed with both of their work um, that they'd put into. Sorry, I could feel the other agency looking at me <laughs> over <laughs> over there. Um, I was I was so impressed. Um, I was, so, I was so impressed with their, um, I was so impressed with, the, with both of their work. Um, but we were looking for a particular project. And it, and it was, it was the, the level of detail and the importance of data, um, pulling data together from different databases, from different agencies across the APS, bringing it together to make a, a particular uh, journey for uh, a business looking to, to do a particular activity. Uh, you know, they made it so easy. And then we kind of hit a, hit a dead end and I said, oh no. That's, it got a bit clunky then. And there was this, oh no, he's asked the question. And, and, and there was members of the APS looking at each other and, that, and I said, well, why, 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 why doesn't that happen this way at that point? Oh, that's, that's from a different, different agency. I said, oh, oh, well, that's all right. You could have, oh no, they don't do it, do it the same way that, that we do it. Or they haven't, they haven't thought about um, uh, modernising or, or, or looking at how this can be, can be done different. I said, so what do you do at that point? Oh, well, well that's not our, not, not our agency. And I'm not saying this is a criticism. I'm just saying that in these systems, we've still got so much more we can do when we learn and we collaborate. Now, when I said as minister, oh, which agency is it? Oh, you should have seen. Every, they could have, could have crawled under the, under, under the table because, because in, this, in the broader system of the APS, you daren't complain to one minister about something within 
another minister's portfolio area. But the solution to this problem was just so small. In fact, the minister responsible wouldn't even want to know about it. In fact, nor would the secretary or the deputy secretary of that particular department. But we had a situation because of the system that we weren't able to resolve that, that one little issue. And I'm pretty confident, though, that they're the things that we're going to see become a thing of the past. I've, I've got great confidence that, um, that those issues were more prevalent you know, three, four, five years ago, and seven, certainly 30 years ago. Um, um, but I, I see that initiatives like the APS Academy are going to start breaking down those barriers. We're going to have an ability for people to say, why are we doing it that way? Why are we doing that step? Um, why does that form um, need a wet signature, perhaps, as an example? Um, that could be done in an, easy, an easier way. So congratulations to uh, the Public Service um, Commission. Um, congratulations to all those uh, involved. Um, thank you to the Australian Public Service for all of your great work. Uh, I see that the Australian Public Service Academy will be something that will add to, that will assist in developing, and will make uh, sure that the, um, the Public Service serves the Australian people um, even better off a very high base from what it is doing so now. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks, Minister. The, um, the stories certainly do help bring to life the importance of operating as one APS. Um, I'd like to invite you back to the stage, along with uh, Commissioner Wolcott and our Head of Academy, Grant Lovelock. Uh, what better way to launch an academy than to cut a cake, um, which we'll ask you to do, and uh, we'll get some photos in the process. That brings to a conclusion the launch of the Academy today. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming along and sharing this moment with us. It's been fantastic. We look forward to working with you all to make the Academy come to life and be a real success. Thank you so much. <laughs>